Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at a topic that is clearly one of the most difficult theological concepts to discuss and to understand. We've been seeking to understand the issue of God's election of those who would be saved. And we've seen that there is a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstanding on this issue. We've also seen that the Bible presents a very clear presentation on this issue. But even though it's very clear, it is beyond our human ability to grasp it all. We've seen as we've been going through Romans that God has made an independent choice based solely upon his own desire of those he would save. And he made this choice before the foundation of the world. Our God knows all things. He knows even the future. He knew all that would happen in this world before he created any part of it. And he had a plan for this world before it began. He knew that humans would rebel. He knew that men would choose to sin. He knew that humans would stand before him condemned because of their sin. But God in his great mercy and grace made a choice to save some humans from the penalty that we are due. And that choice is what we are talking about when we speak of God's election or God's predestination. And we've seen the Bible is very clear. His choice was not dependent on anything that he knew humanity would do. He did not choose people for salvation because he knew they would choose him back or because they were exceptionally smart or lovely to look at or anything else. His choice would not, was not based upon anything that we would do or that we could do. That point was made very clear in our passage last week in Romans, chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. We saw salvation does not depend upon man, but on God who has mercy. We saw this as we ended in verse 18. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. And that is the part of this issue that we struggle so often to comprehend. Because as we read this, it sounds as if that means that men and women are nothing but a group of pawns, a group of robots. It sounds as if God chose some to be saved and then he chose some for hell and that we really have no say whatsoever in our destiny. That's what it sounds like logically as we read these verses. But that is not what Paul is saying. And our passage today deals with these issues of how it is that men are held accountable for our actions and yet God is still sovereign in his choice. We saw last week that Paul was reminding us of God's character so that we might have a better understanding of this issue of election. And he expanded upon God's character in verses 14 through 18, and he continues to do so in our passage this morning. And we're going to see two key aspects of God's character in these verses that is important for us not only to believe, but also to keep in mind as we seek to understand the best we possibly can this most difficult of issues. And through it all, we are reminded of how great and merciful our God truly is. So turn with me please to Romans chapter 9 as we pick it up in verse 19 today as we continue in our study. And as we begin, we're going to see Paul asking the question that really I think most of us ask as we read through this section. How is this fair? How can anyone be held accountable for their actions if God didn't choose them to be saved in the first place? And we see as Paul asks and then answers that question, we're reminded of who God is, that God is the potter. Look at verse 9. 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? Once again, we see Paul using a format that we've seen him use over and over in the book of Romans. He asks a question based upon the truth that he has just stated in the previous verses. Now, if you are thinking this same thing as you read through this chapter, then you are understanding perfectly what Paul is saying. Paul has just said, God hardens those he wants to harden. He has mercy in those whom he desires, and it's all up to his own sovereign choice. And so the natural question as you read that and begin to comprehend that is, how can God find fault with anyone then? Who can resist his will? How can anyone be held accountable for their sin if their destiny was already determined beforehand by God? Because for God's judgment to be just, men must be accountable for their own actions. They must have a choice. And so Paul asks the question, why does he still find fault? And the Greek word that he uses here is memphomai. It means to blame or to bring accusations against someone on the basis that that individual is clearly to blame. And so he asks, how is it that God can find blame in sinners? Just blame. Blame that they rightly deserve if they're only doing what they were created to do in the first place. 
This is the question we struggle with as we consider this topic, isn't it? And so we need to pay very close attention to what comes next because the next two verses provide the biblical answer to this question. How is it that God can blame sinners for their sin when He is the one who chooses who will be saved and passes over others? The answer is given to us in verse 20. On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Now, Paul's answer might surprise you a little bit, and it should, because he answers his question with another series of questions, all of which are designed to bring us to the same conclusion. God is God, and He can do whatever it is that He desires, and He is just in all He does, even when it does not make sense to us. Well, let's look at what he says here. Paul says, Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? And that phrase, answered back, is a single Greek word, antapokrenomai. It means to answer, to criticize in response, to talk back, to dispute, to contradict. It's not just to answer, ask a question, it's to argue or contradict someone. And we have no right to criticize what God does or to argue against His Word. And we've seen in these passages that He has clearly explained to us, man has free will and God is sovereign. The reality is the Bible never tries to reconcile these two truths, and neither should we. They are both presented without ever logically explaining how they can both be, because there is no logical explanation for how they both work. When we demand that this issue must be understandable to us, when we start to question and criticize what God has declared, then we are approaching blasphemous grounds, because we are humans, we are not God. And so we dare not criticize or attack that which God has declared. Now, this does not mean it's wrong to ask honest questions of God. Those that are seeking further understanding of who God is, those are absolutely appropriate. But Paul is here responding to those who attack God's character, those who deny or twist the truth of the Bible simply because they don't see how it all works together, those who refuse to believe what the Bible says just because they don't like it. See, we must understand we will never fully grasp God's sovereign election. No one has been able to fully grasp it in the history of the church. In fact, Paul makes that very clear here because his answer to the question, is God right to blame sinners for their sin when God is the one who chooses those who will be saved, is simply to say, yes, God is right because sinners are guilty of sin. We should never doubt or question if God is just or righteous because He is always righteous, He is always just, and He is always good at all times. He can be nothing but those things. He is also just to blame sinners for their sin because they are guilty. And at the same time, none can come to Him unless they are chosen. That's the way the Bible presents it, whether we understand it or not. And Paul responds this way with these questions because of the nature of what he asks in verse 19. Because when we ask, how is it that God can blame the sinner? That question implies that the sinner is somehow innocent of their crime, or God is unjust in what he is doing. Somehow, perhaps he created the person for the sole purpose of damning them to hell. But that's not what Paul is saying here. And to conclude that is to attack the very righteousness of God. God would never condemn an innocent person to hell. That would be a grave act of injustice, and God is always just. The reality is no human being is innocent. We are all guilty of sin, and God only condemns sinners. But He is under no obligation to save every one of us. He has the right to save those whom He chooses in His mercy, and He has the right to bypass others. But men are not robots. We have free will, and so God's judgment is absolutely just. Now, Paul makes three contrasts here that help us get the right perspective on our relationship to the Lord. And he repeats the same basic theme three times here so that he might put emphasis on this, so that we might get this point. And the first contrast he makes is between men and God. He is God. We are not. We need to remember that. So who are we to think that we have the right to demand any answer of him? Who are we to assume that we could ever possibly understand everything about the nature of our Almighty God. In fact, such thinking is absolute folly. He is the infinite creator, and we are but finite beings. 
His knowledge has no limit. And despite what many humans think, our knowledge does have limits. Now, we can ask him questions, but he chooses what to reveal to us. And we must always remain humble before him because he is God and we are not. We need to understand what the Bible declares and what he has revealed to us, but then believe what it says, even if we don't understand it. Because the reality thing is there is always going to be things in the Bible that are beyond our comprehension. We are not on equal footing with our Creator, and we will never be. And we should never assume just because we don't understand something, it means it's wrong. We must learn to become comfortable by admitting, I don't know how this works. But here's what the Bible says, and I believe it because it's what God says. We are but men, and He is God alone. There's a second contrast made here emphasizing the same reality. We are the thing molded, and he is the molder. He uses two words here. Molded is the Greek word plasma. It means what is formed or what is molded. It's used throughout the Old Testament to refer to God's creative work of creating human beings. Molder is the Greek word plaso. It means the molder, the former, the creator. These words remind us that we are the creatures, and he is the creator. This is a distinction that, honestly, sometimes we act like we've forgotten. But as a created being, we have no right to question our Creator as to why He is doing what He's doing. He can do what He wants because of who He is. He is our Creator. And we know that He is just and good. And that means that everything He does, even when we don't understand how it all works, is good and just and right. He is the Creator. We are not. There's a third contrast that, once again, emphasizes the same truth. He says, we are the clay, and God is the potter. And as the potter, that means he, he has the right to do whatever he wants with the clay. That's his sovereign right, his master of the universe, his almighty God. And Paul uses this illustration of pet potter and clay to remind us of the power and of the loving design that God has for us. You know, a potter takes a lump of clay, and he chooses for himself what it is he wants to make out of the clay. A potter can choose to make a very fine piece of art, or he can make just a very common piece of everyday utensils, like a common kitchen bowl. It's all within his right as the potter. The potter does not answer to the clay. He doesn't ask the clay, Clay, what do you want me to do with you? What do you want me to shape you to be? That's not how it works. The potter sits down, and the potter does what he wants to do. And this illustration is used to remind us that God has the absolute right to do what He wants with this universe and with His creation. In fact, this illustration of potter and clay is used throughout the Old Testament to remind us that God can do whatever He desires. And humanity is but clay in the mighty potter's hands. Isaiah chapter 29 is one of those passages. And the Lord is rebuking those who think they can sin and God doesn't see it. Isaiah 29, starting in verse 15. Woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord and whose deeds are done in the dark place. And they say, who sees us or who knows us? You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay that what is made would say to its maker, he did not make me. Or what is formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding. And the prophet uses this image to point out the absolute absurdity for the clay to deny the power of the potter. And it's absurd for us as human beings to deny the power of our God. And over and over again throughout the Old Testament, this image is used to reinforce this same truth, that God has absolute sovereignty over His creatures. He is the potter. He can save those He desires. He can pass over those He desires. The reality is, while we might want an explanation, He does not owe us an explanation. He is the potter. We are the clay. Whether we like that relationship or not, that is the reality. We need to remember the reality is we all deserve punishment for our sins. Every one of us. And so clearly God is just in punishing sinners because sinners deserve to be punished. If there were a logical, emotionally satisfying explanation to this question of how God can be sovereign in choosing who will be saved and how men are still accountable for their sins, Paul would have given it to us right here. But his answer to this question is basically... Trust God. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's going to do what He's going to do. He's the creator. We are not. And so we've got to trust that what He does is right. That's the answer to this question. And we need to learn to accept that. 
You know, oftentimes we, even as believers, shake our fist at God and we demand to know why. Why, God, did you let this trial come into my life? It's not fair. Why, God, didn't you heal my sickness? Why, God, have you not healed my loved one? Why have you allowed this horrible thing to come into my life? Why, God, have you not fulfilled my desires? And we demand to know why, and we shake our fist at the heaven, and we think we deserve an answer. But we would do well to remember this passage. Who are we to attack God? We are the thing molded. We are clay in the potter's hands. And we need to remember that he is a good and a loving and a gracious and a merciful God. And the answer to the questions of why is to remember his character and to trust him because he is a good God. And while we might not understand what the potter is doing in our life, we've got to trust that he is a good and a gracious maker. We will never fully understand how sovereignty and free will work together. Many have tried over the ages and no one has been able to reconcile these two. And the Bible doesn't do that. It's very clear in this passage. Paul didn't even try to explain how these two fit together. He just put them both in these passages. We need to understand and accept both are true as we see presented here. And we can take comfort in his absolute sovereignty. And we can rest assured that all who have a desire to be saved can come for salvation. As Paul continues in verse 22, we are reminded, not only is God the potter, not only is he our creator, he is also patient. Look at verse 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now, there is a difference among translators as to the best way to translate this particular verse. Basically, it can be translated in one of two ways. It can be translated along the lines of the New American Standard here. The way this is translated suggests that God wanted to demonstrate his wrath and his power, but instead he chose patience, meaning that God wanted to show wrath, but he has not. Or it can be translated as the ESV and others does. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his known, known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now, this translation puts the emphasis that God's purpose in having patience was to show his wrath and to make his power known. He shows these character traits by being patient with vessels of wrath. I favor this second translation here. I think it fits the context a little better. Because it isn't that God wanted to show his wrath, but he hasn't but rather it's because God wanted to demonstrate his wrath and his power that he has exercised great patience. God has allowed sin to exist for the reason of displaying his great wrath and his power to an even greater manner than he would have done otherwise. Could paraphrase this verse in this way. Paul says, what objection can you possibly make since God has tolerated with great patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. When you realize his purpose in doing so has been to demonstrate his wrath and to make known his power. See, how can we really object to what God is doing when everything is for the purpose of revealing his power and bringing glory to himself, which is why God does everything that he does? The purpose of God's patience is to allow the rebellion of his creation to gain such intensity that his ultimate victory is all the more glorious. It also highlights the mercy that he bestows upon those whom he has chosen. He is patient to give all the opportunity to come to salvation. So we should remember that God could have rightly ended humanity with Adam's sin, and that could have been the end of the human race. But because of his great patience, he has waited to bring his full wrath upon sinners so that he can finish his ultimate plan. And one day he will reveal his great power and his wrath and his mercy for all the universe to see. The reality is every person who has ever lived or ever will live or is living today does so for the purpose of glorifying God. That's the reason we were created as human beings. We were created in his image to bear his image rightly and to give him glory. And the reality is that is what all human beings do. We either do it actively or we do it passively. We either do it willingly or we do it unwillingly. We will either do it in heaven or we'll do it in hell for all eternity. Every human being will glorify God. That is the sole purpose for which we were created. We will either do so as objects of his mercy and his grace as believers, or we will do it as objects of his wrath and power as unbelievers. 
See, those who are unbelievers, sinners who are rebelling against His mercy today, are still bringing glory to God, even though that's the furthest thing from their mind. Because they reveal that God is a very patient God. He has not yet brought them the punishment they deserve. And so every time a sinner takes another breath, he is actually giving glory to God's great patience because he's able to continue to breathe. And in eternity, those sinners will reveal God's wrath and power as objects of His wrath because they will show that He is just in punishing sin. All humans will give glory to God for all eternity. How we do it depends upon our choices in this life, whether we put our faith in Him or whether we reject Him. The patience of God is displayed in how He tolerates the wicked today. God has allowed sinful humanity to continue to exist to display His patience and His wrath. And He is glorified when all of His attributes are displayed in the universe. Now, sinners who rebel against God's grace will one day suffer His just wrath for their sins. And they will be eternal evidence that God's wrath is pure and God's wrath is righteous. His power will be manifested in the final judgment and punishment of sin yet to come. One day, every sinner will stand before the great white throne and they will be judged. And as they are shown to be guilty for their sin against their Creator, God's glory will be revealed to all the universe. And He will be shown to be holy as sin is punished. And He will also be shown to be gracious as He allowed those sinners to remain on earth, despite their rebellion towards Him their entire lives. His patience is displayed in enduring the scorn of sinners in the present. And it shows the absolute glory and greatness of our God. And on a future day, all the universe will see the glory of our great God. God has the right to eliminate every sinner at their first sin. But He has patience because He desires to demonstrate His wrath and His power. And so He has patience on vessels of wrath. That reference to vessels of wrath is referring to unbelievers. And we'll see in a moment the believers are referred to as vessels of mercy. Notice what we're told in particular about the vessels of wrath. They are prepared for destruction. Now, this passage, and in particular, this phrase, has been often misunderstood, primarily because of a failure to understand the Greek grammar that is used here by Paul. Many people think that this means that God has actively created unbelievers for the sole purpose of going to hell, and He's the one who prepares them for destruction. That is what is often referred to as the doctrine of double predestination. That is, God chooses those who will go to heaven, and at the same time, He actively chooses those who will go to hell. Some mistakenly conclude this means that men have no free will, and we are all mere pawns in God's universe. But that is not what the Bible teaches, and that is not what this passage is telling us at all. While it may be a logical conclusion of God's election, it's not an accurate understanding, nor is it a biblical understanding. God does not make us sinful. We can do that all on our own. He doesn't create any for the sole purpose of sending them to hell. Men make that choice for themselves by their act of rebellion against God's Word. God simply leaves men in their sin unless they repent and turn to Him. The Greek word prepared here is kartorizo. It means to prepare or to make adequate, to cause to be fully qualified. The verb that's used in this particular verse is in the passive Tense. And that's a very important observation to make because it means that God is not the subject of the one who did the preparing. God is not the one who caused these vessels to be fully qualified, to be prepared for destruction. And this verse is very careful to use a grammatical structure that puts the responsibility not on God, but on the vessels themselves. They are prepared for destruction by their own actions and their own choices. Now, God will make sure that that destruction takes place because He is a righteous judge. But those who suffer hell do so because they have prepared themselves for destruction by their own sinful deeds. Sinners prepare themselves for destruction by their sin and rebellion against the Lord. They cannot blame God and say, you just made me this way and I never had a choice because they made the choice to sin. We read this in 2 Thessalonians 1, referring specifically to those who were persecuting believers, but really it's in reference to all unbelievers. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The sad reality is men and women bring eternal destruction, the punishment of hell, upon themselves because of their response to the Creator. And if anyone has denied the Lord Jesus Christ, if they have refused to receive Him as their Lord and Savior, then they have prepared themselves 
for an eternity in hell. Anyone. No matter how good they might seem on the outside, no matter how righteous they might seem, no matter how religious they might be, if they do not know Jesus as their Savior, they are vessels of God's wrath. Those who have decided their own eternal destiny by denying Jesus and preparing themselves for destruction. Now, verse 23, Paul continues, and now he speaks of believers. He says, And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. This is the other reason for God's enduring with much patience. Not only so his wrath will be demonstrated through unbelievers, but so the riches of his glory will be demonstrated through believers. Remember we saw last week that mercy means to show kindness and compassion. To have mercy means to not give someone what they actually deserve. It's to not give someone the punishment that they are due. All of us deserve wrath. But those whom God calls are described as vessels of mercy. As believers, we are those who have been shown mercy by our Creator. We are those who have a hope and assurance of our future because of the mercy of our great God. His mercy is the reason that we are gathered here this morning. His mercy is the reason that we can take another breath. And it is a wonderful image used to describe believers. We are vessels of mercy. We are what we are because God did not give us what we deserve. We exist because He had compassion on us. And vessels of mercy are described as those whom he prepared beforehand. The Greek word that's used here is different. It's protomazo. It means to prepare beforehand or to make ready in advance. And this is an active verb, meaning that God is the one who does the preparation. He is the one who makes vessels of mercy prepared in advance. And so there is a stark difference here between how vessels of mercy and how vessels of wrath are prepared. Unbelievers prepare themselves, while believers are prepared by God before the foundation of the earth to be His. So then we see that God actively prepares believers for glory and passively unbelievers are prepared for destruction. Now that's a very fine line to draw, I know. It's a very fine distinction, but it's one that is very clearly intended by the grammar that is used here. God does not choose people for hell. He did not create people for the sole purpose of punishing them for all eternity. Men bring that punishment upon themselves by their sins. God in His great grace chooses some vessels for glory. God is a just God. All have the opportunity to come, but sadly the majority prepare themselves for destruction. And yet God in His great mercy prepares some for salvation. Verse 24, even us, whom He also called not from the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. And Paul makes it very clear here that he's talking about us, believers, when he refers to the vessels of mercy. When he says, even us whom he has called. Both Jews and Gentiles have received the gift of salvation. Those who have are those who are referred to as vessels of mercy. We don't deserve this choice. Jews did not deserve it. Gentiles don't deserve it. But God called a people to himself from all tribes and all nations, all people groups, all colors, all races. We are all unified in the body of Christ when we put our faith in Him. When we respond to His call and reveal ourselves that we are vessels of mercy prepared by Him for His glory. We are chosen to bring glory to God. That is our purpose as believers. Sadly, sometimes we forget this. And when we do, we start to lose our focus in life. Sometimes we as believers forget that we are chosen to make known the riches of His glory. And that's not just something that's going to take place after this life. That's our purpose for existing in the present. But oftentimes, we forget that. And we start thinking that the universe revolves around us. And we think that God should do things to make me happy. And while we would never admit it to anyone else, we pretty much expect God to jump when we tell Him to jump. If we pray for something, we expect Him to do exactly what we request without any variance. And sometimes that's the way we approach God. It's as if everything is about us and what we want. But that's not what the Bible declares. God does not exist for our pleasure. We exist for His. He does not jump when we say jump. We obey Him. Now God in His graciousness answers our prayers, but we are for His pleasure. He is not for ours. And when we begin to understand this, that everything we are is for His glory, then we can begin to look at life with the proper perspective. 
Now, the wonder is God in His graciousness does respond to our prayers. And sometimes He says yes, sometimes He says no, sometimes He says wait. But whatever the sovereign guy decides to our prayers, that is His right because He is a sovereign God. And we must learn to accept His answer and embrace it and look for ways to give Him glory in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. Because we are vessels of mercy that exist for His glory. We don't exist for our own pleasure. We don't exist for our own desire, for His. And it is so impor important that we understand that, especially if we want to ever have any hope of understanding this issue of God's election. Because once we begin to understand what this passage is saying, then we can begin to accept the doctrine of election as we ought to. When we realize who God is, that He is sovereign, that He is also good and just and righteous, then we can rest in His election and His purpose and His plan. Because even though we don't understand it, we trust that He is good. Often we struggle with election simply because we fail to remember God's character and who we are in relationship to Him. And that's why Paul reminds us of those things in this passage. He is the potter, we are the clay. Everything God does is right and just, however it is that He makes His choice. It is a just and merciful choice. Men are held accountable for our sins, and yet God is the one who chooses who will be saved. We are reminded that God is patient. He does not wipe sinners off the face of the earth the moment they sin. He is patient so that all who are called will come to Him for salvation. And God will be glorified by every human being, either willingly or unwillingly. I do hope you are among those who have willingly bowed the knee to Jesus in this life. But if you are here and Jesus is not your Savior, it is not too late to come to Him and receive Him as Lord and Savior. You can come to Him today and receive the gift of faith that is available to all. And if you do that, then you will realize that you are one whom God chose before the foundation of the earth to be a vessel of mercy prepared for His glory. And if you'd like to speak to somebody about that, please see me after the service. I know as we have spent the last several weeks on this topic of election, it can raise all sorts of questions. Sadly, Paul does not answer every question on this topic. But if you have questions and you want to talk to someone about it, I'm not going to be able to answer every question, but I'd be happy to discuss it with you further. And So if you want to talk after the service or get together over a cup of coffee, I would love to talk with you more if you would like to discuss this. I think we can sum up what we've learned about election this far in Romans in this manner. Every person who goes to hell goes there because they deserve it as just punishment for their sins. It will be their punishment for their choice to reject God. And every person who goes to heaven goes there because God chose them first for salvation before the foundation of the earth apart from anything that they would do. And all of those whom God chooses will come to faith and only those whom He chooses will come to Him. Why did He choose some and not everyone? because that was his sovereign right and an act of mercy. How does it all work together with free will? We can't explain it, but it does work. And God is always just and he is always merciful. And that's about as a complete an answer as we get in this far in Romans chapter 9 regarding election. God's character is revealed through the election of who will be saved. He is the potter, we are the clay. That means he has the right to do what he wants, when he wants, with whom he wants. And he is patient. And that is shown in that humanity is still here on this earth. As believers, we can take great comfort in knowing we are those who are vessels of mercy. We are those whom God has poured his mercy upon. And so we have a relationship with him. And that title of a vessel of mercy is not just for the future. It belongs to us now. And so that means not only do we receive God's mercy, but we are to be those who show mercy to others. And so let us seek to do that, to not only enjoy the mercy God has given us, but also be merciful to those around us. And let us thank Him every day that He has chosen us and that He has saved us, something we did not deserve, but He has given to us freely. Let us pray.